Well, I think we're going to get started here. Good evening. Hello. Hi, Cameron. All right, back in 1 John chapter 2, we're going to pick up at verse, I guess verse 9 is where we're going to pick up at. Uh, again, before we start, Theron, do you want to open our time in prayer? Okay. Dear Lord, thank you for this day, this time that we can uh, come apart from the world, Lord, and dig into your word. Lord, pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear, and most importantly, hearts to understand what you would have for us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So 1 John chapter 2, right there in verse 9, picks up and says, He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. And that darkness we're going to examine here tonight just a little bit. Um, we, we looked at a little bit of this last week when we were uh, looking at these other verses here, uh, especially in verse 8, speaking of because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. Uh, there was one verse that I wanted to go to that we didn't, and I'd like to look at that in verse 8, and that's Colossians chapter 1. So if you want to turn your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1, and we're going to look at verse 13. This is speaking in regards to the darkness being past and the true light now shineth. Okay, and that, that shineth, again, that E-T-H on the end of that word, it's a continual tense of that word, so it continues on. It's not past tense, it's not future tense, present. It's a continual tense, hitting all the tenses. And so, uh, in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13, where this is speaking of, of God and, and God the Father, verse 13 says, "...who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son." All right, so that delivering from the power of darkness, when you consider that, you think of uh, Paul when he was uh, talking about um, coming and, and uh, delivering the people from the power of darkness and from Satan and, and the bringing the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. And uh, you consider over in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 where it talks that, that uh, Satan is actively blinding the people, uh, the lost people in this world, because he wants their eyes to remain dim, Okay. There are, there are people who have their eyes completely darkened to spiritual matters, okay? But there are those whose eyes are just dim. And the problem with having dim eyes, eyes that can't see, they're, they're not completely blind, so you're, you're you know, relying on the rest of your senses, but you can't see clearly. The problem with that is, is you can make an opinion based on what you can kind of see, okay? Uh, there have been times where I've been driving at night, and there will be deer out and there will be, you know, animals crossing the road. And, you know, on a good clear night, you know, where it's, it's really dark, um, you know, the, the air is clear. My lights, the high beams will shine a long ways, right? And so you can see those deer coming from the fields and you know way ahead of time to slow down or else you're going to hit those things. But the problem is, is when a night is kind of not quite falling into full darkness, Okay, it's not light. You can't really see clearly, but it's not dark enough yet for your, your headlights to really take effect, and it's just kind of dim. All right? I, I don't know right now. It might even be close to that time. Okay? And in those, your eyes can play tricks on you, and you might think that that bush standing there beside the road is just a bush, and you make up your opinion on based on that assumption, and all of a sudden that bush jumps out in front of you, you have $3,000 worth of car damage, okay? Uh, those of us around here, grow up around here, live around here, um, understand that, that aspect of it. Uh, and so there are some whose, whose eyes are just dimmed, all right? I, I would put those, these type of people as those who have grown up in church, but don't really know God. They know a form of godliness. They know a form of religion. They know a form of, of uh, the Bible, but they don't really know him in his clarity, in his fullness. Um, and because of that, we formulate opinions and we live our lives according to those opinions with really no regard to what the word of God says on those things. Okay. Now, those that Satan is actively keeping blinded in, in that darkness, though, um, uh, it says, uh, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, uh, in whom the, the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the glorious light of the gospel should shine unto them. Okay, so Satan is keeping the minds of people blinded in darkness. 
But in Colossians 1.13, we see that God hath delivered us. Hath is past tense. Okay, so he hath delivered us. He's, he's writing this to Christians, okay? So he's writing it to those who are believers, who are born of God. And he is putting this, himself in this thing too, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. Now, darkness has a power to it. Your Bible says it does. To, to think that, oh, darkness just is the absence of light, well, it's absolutely true. And against light, darkness has no power. But for those who are in the midst of that darkness, there is great power in that darkness. Because we see time and time again where that it is the fact that God makes us free from the power of darkness. All right? So here, he hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. And again, that word translated is a fun study. You study that thing out. There's a few places where it's used in the Bible. And when you consider what a translation is... It is taking something, you know, when we, we think of uh, translating from one language into another, it's taking, let's just say, since we have some Spanish speakers with us tonight, okay, uh, Brother Chacon's native tongue is Spanish. That is what he grew up. That is what his heart speaks. That's what he dreams in. It's what he thinks in is Spanish. And he has to translate everything in his head into English in order for us to understand it. Okay? In the same token, everything that I say, he has to mentally translate into Spanish in his heart. Okay? And that is, that is how language works. It's taking from one language and putting it directly into another language. Okay? And so what does this mean that he hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son? Well, it means he took you from one kingdom and put you directly into another kingdom fitly perfect. Okay? It's not, it's not just a, a semi-translation. It's not just, ah, this is the best we can do with this thing. No, God has taken you directly from the kingdom of darkness and put you into the kingdom of light if you're born of God. All right, Let, lest I, I put it out there and think that, you know, everyone in this room is born of God. I know that we, we do have some folks in this room, some, some ones who are seeking God. They are lost. They know they're lost. They want to know this great God of heaven. They want God to reveal himself to them. And so they're seeking him, actively seeking him. They're looking for that translation from the power of darkness into the power of God. To believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, um, we'll read verse 14 because you can't leave this out when we're, when we're looking at this. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And we looked at that the other night as that eternal redemption. Eternal meaning having no beginning and having no end. Everlasting in your Bible, okay? Um, John 3, 15 and 16. One uses everlasting, one uses eternal. All, both speaking of life. Everlasting life has a beginning but has no ending. Eternal life has no beginning and has no end. Okay, so that is God. So that eternal life that we have through Jesus Christ is Jesus Christ himself. That is the eternal life, okay? And so that eternal redemption, when God looks at you, he has redeemed you from your sin. He has redeemed you entirely and completely, so much so that when he looks all throughout eternity past, he doesn't see a single sin laid to your account once you've been born of God. And when he looks all the way into eternity future, he doesn't see a single sin on your account because of that blood, because of this redemption we have through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Okay, And that is a, that is a glorious thing to me. It does make me want to shout. I will refrain tonight because my throat is a little hoarse. So, but back into 1 John. Now that we hit on that, I didn't, I didn't go into the depth of that that I wanted to last time. We were kind of crimped on time at the end. But now, verse 9 in uh, 1 John chapter 2. He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. All right, so here again, we looked at that phrase of he that saith, if any man say, all right, if we say. Um, and these are the things that we believe in our heart. And so we speak them out of our mouth because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh, Jesus said. And so it's in your heart that you uh, are in the light. You believe that you're in the light, but if you have hatred towards your brother, and the disciples ask, you know, who is my neighbor? Who is my brother? And he says, everyone. Mm -hmm. So if you have hatred towards anyone, if you are harboring hatred towards anyone, you have to look at this and it says, if you hate your brother, you are in darkness even until now. You have not been translated from that kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. 
you are still in that darkness. All right, and we're going to see this darkness uh, expounded upon in the next few verses here. Uh, but now we go over to verse 10. It says, he that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. We're going to look at a couple of phrases in here. Um, but turn over to uh, 1 John 3.14, and we'll read that. This verse says, He that loveth his brother and abideth in the light, and there is none... Uh, he that loveth his brother abideth in the light, sorry. And there is none occasion of stumbling in him. 1 John 3.14, We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Okay, so we see the importance of love in a believer's life. And if it's not there, it's not something you have to stimulate. It's not something you have to try to work up because it is a supernatural love that God puts in you when you're born of God. In fact, that's the, one of the very things that God used to show my wife that she was lost. And the very thing he used to save her was that she did not have love. She didn't have love for me, and if she didn't have love for me as her husband, how could she possibly love God? Though she grew up in church, though she was holding to a profession of faith at four, she went through her entire life believing she was saved, saying she was in the light, but all inside, she did not have love. And because of that love, she still abode in darkness, and God was able to show her that, bring her to repentance, change her mind on that, and she believed that Jesus Christ was sufficient for all of that love. Okay, And so in this... Uh, we see the importance of love in the life of a believer. And if you say that you're in the light, if you say that you love God, if you say that you are a believer, that you're born of God, but you don't have love, if you are harboring hatred, that, and it, that word hate, heth, E-T-H again, it's just a continual hate. And I, I, sadly, I know some professing Christians who claim to be born of God, but every time you talk to them, it's only hatred that comes out of their lips. They can put on a show from time to time, but down in their heart, you can see they just harbor hatred. And because of that, according to the word of God, they are abiding in death. They're not in the light. They're not born of God. And so um, it, it continues on there in verse 15, but when we get over to chapter 3, we'll hit that. All right, verse 10, uh, back in, in chapter 2. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light. Okay, and again, ETH, I, I, can, I can hit on that a bazillion times because there's so many of these in your King James Bible. And it, it's so important to understand that that is not just an old English way of saying a verb. Okay, it is a specific verb ending. We would say love and loved and will love. Okay, all three of those are contained in that loveth. Okay? It is a continual tense. It isn't past tense. It isn't present tense. It isn't future tense. It's a continual tense, and it continues on, and it doesn't stop. And that's why when you see the, the phrase believeth, that is not a belief that comes and goes and comes and goes. Well, I used to believe, but I don't really believe that anymore. Uh, I heard that from, uh, who was it, the worship leader? I can't remember his name right offhand, but the worship leader for uh, Hillsong Church. He was, he was the worship leader for that big, huge church down in Texas. Um, there's many campuses all over the world. Uh, Justin Bieber is a member of that church, and um, Kanye West, if all those names mean anything to you at all. But this man decided that he just did not believe Christianity anymore. Though he claimed to be saved, he said, I just, I just can't believe it anymore. But he that believeth is he that is born of God. Okay, that is, that is the fact of the matter. Okay, that, that's not a verse, what I just quoted to you just now. Okay? But if you have that believeth, that, that continual belief, and it isn't, it isn't that... No, I'm not even going to go there with it. If you don't have that continual belief, if it comes and goes and doubts plague you, because God promises a full assurance of faith, a full assurance of faith. If it comes and goes, it's not a believeth. And, and you're still abiding in darkness. You don't have what this Bible promises you will have when you are born of God. Translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Passed from death unto life. Made a new creature in Christ. The entirety of the Godhead residing, dwelling, abiding in you. You abiding in Jesus Christ. Being seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. When that takes place, 
it, it shatters doubts. Okay? That's why, uh, you know, he said, uh, I would that, Paul said, I would that men everywhere would pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Okay? And doubting your salvation cannot come from Satan. We, we've hit on this before. Satan will not cause you to doubt your salvation. It's contrary to what he is trying to do. He is trying to convince you that you are okay. And if he can keep you thinking that you're okay your entire life, when you get to the end of your life and you die and you never sought the thing out any further, you think, oh, no, I, I prayed when I was four. I prayed when I was six and 12 and then 17. But God didn't save me until 2009. I was 17 plus five, 23. So I was 23. Wait, no, 17 plus seven, 24. I can do the maths. <laughs> Not very well. All right. Uh, unlearned and ignorant man. But, but no, uh, in that, you know, I had, I had a profession. I had prayed and I had asked God to save me. I had, I had asked Jesus into my heart as a child. But I didn't believe that Jesus Christ was the son of God. There was still unbelief residing in my heart. It manifests itself in many different ways. It manifests itself in rebellion against my parents, in hatred towards others. Uh, it manifests itself in perversion. It manifested itself in wickedness in my life. But it was all, the root of the whole thing was I did not believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. Had I believed Jesus Christ was the Son of God, I would have been born again at that moment and my life would have changed. But it did not change. I can point back and I can look at 2009 and with absolute confidence and assurance, and I've wrestled with God with this thing, and I look back at that time in 2009, he saved me that night. I absolutely know it. There are times from that point forward where I gave myself into my flesh. I gave myself over to it and I allowed my carnal mind to take the reins and I allowed my carnal mind to direct and to drive. And when that happens, you fall into wickedness. You fall into sin. All right, you stumble into the thing, okay? That's why we have in, in uh, 2 Corinthians uh, 10, 13. 2 Corinthians 10, 13? Oh, I just preached it the other day. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Uh, there is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful in that he will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. We also have 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Um, look at uh, uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. Right there in the middle of the verse. And if any man sin, not when, but if. God makes it so you can live a life free from sin. It is only when we yield ourselves to our flesh, when we yield ourselves to our carnal mind, when we yield ourselves to the temptation, you know, uh, uh, Yield not to temptation, for temptation is sin. Or for yielding is sin, not temptation. For yielding is sin. Boy, I have, we haven't sung that in a long time. And I, I was just trying to form the, the words in my mind. Just because you're tempted by something doesn't mean that you've automatically fallen into sin. But Satan wants you to think that you have. Satan wants to think that it's already over and done with. That there's, there's no hope. You, you've already sinned because you're tempted with this thing. What a wretch. You're the only one that deals with this. No. Every single person in the entire world has been tempted with the things that you are tempted with. Not only been tempted with them, but been taken by them. Okay, been taken captive by that temptation. All right? And so that, that reality is there. But rather than sin reigning on the throne of your heart, it will be a thief in the corner. It'll be that, that, little, that little rat in the corner just chewing away at the foundation. Just, just, just destroying you on the inside. And so we have 1 John 1, 9. And we have uh, chapter 2, verse 1. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins. That propitiation, it's the place where we take our sins to. That's what a propitiation is. The propitiation was the mercy seat in the Old Testament. That's where the priest went in behind the veil and brought the sins of the people to that propitiation on the mercy seat. Guess who was on the mercy seat? Jesus Christ, the eternal word. Jehovah God sitting there, abiding between the cherubims on that mercy seat. 
And in that same way, Jesus Christ is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. All right. And so just backing up into that to kind of bring all this together, you know, again, this is how we know that we know him. If we keep his commandments, if any man say he know it, he, uh, what does it say? He that saith, I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. All right, so you check your life. You just look at your life. What is your life proof? What does your life say? I know what your lips may say, but what does your life show? What is your character? Who are you when no one else is watching? Okay, Are you living in the fear of the Lord? Are you not, not living in absolute holy terror over the thing, but just living according to the fear of the Lord? Following after that thing. Loving him. Knowing and, and being terrified to, to, to break his heart any further with any sin. Terrified of his holiness, terrified of that wrath, that anger. You don't, you, don't, you don't want that. He's a holy God. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so if you abide in that fear, if you live in the fear of the Lord, it isn't a fear that you're just continually terrified. There's a peace when you abide in the fear of the Lord. Because the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance, faith, uh, it says, against such, there is no law. Mm-hmm. So when you're abiding in the fear of the Lord, and you're walking with him, you walk in the spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you're walking in the spirit, the fruits of the spirit are going to come out of your life. And the things that are going to come out as actions are then going to be such that there is no law of God against it. You will be in the perfect, pleasing sight of Almighty God. And that brings absolute peace. Okay? But it's a terrifying thing when you've disobeyed your father and you know he's going to catch you. Isn't it? There's no way you can hide this one. That car is absolutely stuck in that ditch and there is no way I'm getting this out on my own. I got to call dad. I'm sorry to say I was able to get the car out of the ditch and dad never found out. But I was terrified. All right. So at any rate, again, this is why God gives us the family so that we can understand God, so we can understand who he is and and why he does the things that he does and how he loves us and how he shows us these things. Okay, let's go on down into verse 10 again. Um, He that loveth his brother abideth in the light. And we're going to look at this occasion of stumbling. And there is none occasion of stumbling in him. I have three passages we're going to turn to. The first one should be just maybe one page back in 2 Peter 1.10. We're actually going to read 2 Peter 1 verses 5 through 10. But 2 Peter 1.10 is the verse we're looking at. And this is in regards to this occasion of stumbling. Again, if, if anybody has any question, if something you know, that I say doesn't, it isn't quite clear, you know, just, just speak up and, and we'll, we'll hash it out. We'll work it out. All right, 2 Peter 1, verse 5. Uh, you know what? Let's, let's read verse 10 first, and then we'll back up and look at verse 5. So, turn, Sorry, I apologize for that. This is what we're going to do. We're going to verse 10. It says, Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. Okay? Another way to put that is that you'll have none occasion of stumbling in you. Okay, this is what that is speaking of, that falling. Now, what things, though? It says, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. So if you do these things, what things? Well, let's back up to verse 5. Verse 5. And beside this, giving all diligence. Okay, and we just saw that. All diligence makes your calling and election sure. Giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. And to virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. Now, it's important to note, when you see a list like this, it is a progressive list. Okay, You can't have charity at the very end. You can't add charity before you have virtue. Okay? You can't even add to your, your faith virtue before you have faith. 
All right, and we have the faith of Jesus Christ. It's what we're justified by, according to Galatians chapter 2. It's the faith that we now, the, in the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. It's, it's the same faith that we walk in. It's his faith that he gives us. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Okay, And so when you see all of this, you have to have the faith of Jesus Christ first. And the very first thing you need to add to that is virtue. Virtue will cure your bad character. The opposite of bad character is virtue. Okay? Living a virtuous life means that your character is impeccable. It matches the character of God. And God will do that in you. So many people's personalities are stained by bad character. And your bad character can be really hindered. It, it can be affected greatly by the habits that your flesh has gained. Okay? A lot of people, their character just is absolutely rotten because they give themselves over to the flesh because of the, the, uh, the sin that does so easily beset us and all of that. All of these things, you need to mortify your members. You, you, can't, you can't sanctify your flesh. You can't uh, consecrate your flesh. You can't set your flesh apart to serve God. The only thing you can do is mortify it, kill it. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And so this life that we now live in the flesh, it is by the faith of the Son of God. And if we are living by the faith of the Son of God, he is going to make it so that we can daily and hourly and minutely and secondly, however often you need to do it, you can crucify that flesh. You die to that thing. And you live unto God. Your flesh will one day be adopted. Your soul and spirit were born into the household of God by the Holy Ghost. Okay? And so that adoption is coming. That's the, the resurrection or the rapture, depending on what side of the grave you're on at that point. Okay? Um, the dead in Christ shall rise first, I think, just because they've they got six more feet to go. It, it's kind of tongue-in-cheek, but it makes sense, so that's kind of where I'm going with it. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain will meet them in the air and, and will forever be with the Lord. Okay? And so at that moment, our flesh will be redeemed. At this moment, if you're born of God, your soul and spirit are redeemed. Your spirit has been revived in you. It's been made alive. You passed from death unto life. Okay? Your soul has been redeemed. The sin that stained it is nowhere to be found. It is as pure white as the pages in your Bible. Unless you've spilled coffee on them, which I did to my wife's Bible the other day. I felt terrible. Still feel terrible. Okay? It just looks more lived in now. That's what she said. She's so gracious. She's so gracious to live with me. <laughs> oh, goodness. All right. Well, let's keep going. We went through this whole list of things, and I'm not going to re-preach all down through this. We'd be here for another two hours. We don't need that for right now. Unless you would like to talk about it afterwards, and we'll come drop back in. But verse 8, it says, For if these things be in you. All right, so it's not a guarantee. But if you're born of God, then you fulfill that if these things be in you. If these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so these are really the things that will show Christian growth. Add to your faith virtue. Your character is cleaned up. Add to virtue knowledge. Now that your character is cleaned up and your mind is clear and your eyes are clean and, and your, your spirit is clean and you have no uncleanness in you, you can see the word of God clearly for the first time in your life and then you can add to that virtue knowledge. You can glean knowledge out of the word of God. Add to knowledge temperance. Once you've learned that, you learn that temperance, the right amount of things. Okay, Temperance is much deeper than just self-control. Temperance is knowing how much of something to have in your life. And that takes a lot more temperance than just self-control. Okay? Some things that I can do in my life, there are others here in this room, you cannot do because you know where it will take you. All right? This is some of the liberty that we have in Christ. There are some things in here that some of you can do that I cannot because I know where it will take me. Okay? There are certain things in my life that I do not have anything to do with, though there isn't a strict command against it. 
Why? Because I know what it will do to me. Because I don't have temperance in that area. May come a day when God teaches me that temperance and I'm able to bear it, but I'm not willing to risk it. Because I, I live in the fear of the Lord. I love my God. I love my Jesus who died and gave himself for me. And I don't want to, to stain his holy name. He's abiding in me. He's with me. And I want to have the mind of Christ and I can't cloud it with things. So, but anyway, going through all of that. Uh, verse 9. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off. All right? And so there is that darkness. He's blind. You're lacking these things. You don't have virtue, which is clouding everything. That's where it's got to start. Some of you in here have unclean minds because of the things that you look at on the computer or on the phone, on the internet. And your minds are just unclean. And so you don't have that virtue. Your character stinks. When you're, not, when you're alone, when no one else is around, or maybe only when a certain few people are around, your character is just rotten. And God knows it. And you know it because you've never added to your faith virtue. Maybe you've added knowledge first. Well, knowledge puffeth up, but it won't if there's virtue involved. Okay? So, uh, but he's blind and cannot see afar off and have forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Well, once your heart has been purged from your old sins, if you go so long abiding where you used to in those sins, you'll forget that you were purged from them in the first place. And you can stumble back into those things. You can fall back into that. Doesn't mean you lost your salvation. I would give great diligence to make your calling and election sure. Make sure it isn't that, you know, you had vain belief, as Peter talks about, or, that you, or Paul in Galatians, that you believed in vain. Paul said he stood in doubt of the Galatians. I stand in doubt of you, he said. Because of the things that they were struggling with, he was saying a born-again person should not struggle with this. I stand in doubt of you. I don't know if you're in or not, though you claim to be. And the same thing has to be done when you find yourself continually falling back into something. Am I really born of God or am I just holding to a vain belief? What rules my heart? Does the sin rule my heart or is the mind of Christ ruling me? What, which is it? And you just give diligence to make that calling and election sure. You, you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You go before God. Find these things out. That flash of doubt comes across your mind when the preacher is preaching and he's preaching on the judgments of God or preaching on hell or preaching on sin and preaching on unrighteousness, preaching on God's wrath upon all of those things. And, and you, you just, you have that flash of doubt. Boy, I, wonder if, I wonder if that's me. That's the Holy Ghost reproving you of sin. According to Jesus' words, the Holy Ghost, the Comforter, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin because you believe not on me, he said. And so that flash of doubt, that's the Holy Ghost trying to show you, you need to be seeking God out. You're holding on to a vain belief. You're holding on to a profession as a child. You're holding on to this thing that you did. You're holding on to your baptism, your good works, your church membership, your, your activity in the church, all of this. By the way, all those things are great. But church membership, good, uh, I'll put this in there, good works, serving in the church, none of those things are the fruit of the Spirit. Being nice to people, that's not a fruit of the Spirit. Kindness, gentleness. But unless the fruit of the Spirit is there, it doesn't matter how much you help out around the church, it doesn't matter how much you do, unless the fruit of the Spirit is there, the Spirit is not there. Okay, And th this is just, again, looking at 1 John in light of all these things, 1 John shows us what a born-again person looks like, what a lost person looks like. And we find love at the very center of it throughout the entire thing. It all focuses around love. Love is the fulfillment of the law. That's what Jesus did. He fulfilled the law. He didn't destroy it. He fulfilled it. And so, once you are under grace, you are no longer under the law. But the law is our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Without the law, you don't know what sin is. You may be able to agree, yeah, I'm a sinner. But without the law showing you in the inward parts that your heart is in rebellion against a holy God and to show you exactly where the root of that rebellion is. Until that happens, you, you're not born of God. It doesn't matter how many times you've called on the name of the Lord. 
How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Romans 10, 14, the very, very next verse. And so, you know, just examine these things as you're going through this stuff. Just the reason I'm, I'm so adamant about this is because I went seven years lost. My wife went, oh, how many years? The majority of her life lost, believing she was saved, believing that what she had done was enough. The problem was we were both resting in what we had done. I had decided I was ready and it was according to my will that I was going to call on the name of the Lord and be saved. But 1 John chapter 1 tells us those are, which are born of God are born not by blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants every single person to come to repentance. That is his will for your life. To come to that point where you realize my thinking is contrary to God's thinking, and what God's word says does not match up with my thinking, and I need to turn right about. I need to just go the exact opposite of the way. And God gives you that repentance. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging the truth. It is something that God wants to give you. It's something that God desires to give you. It's something that God wills to give you. If you would just believe that he does and that he will and that he can. You believe his son. Believe the record given of his son. It's all wrapped up in that belief. And God will help you to believe too. He does it all. He does the whole thing. And then you say, well, what's there left for me to do? Nothing. When you believe, he does it. And that belief is a choice. You choose to believe or you choose to stand in unbelief. And it's the most confusing, hardest thing that you can ever grasp until God shows it to you. And then it's like, oh, duh. (laughs) But it's according to his timing. It's according to his will. It's according to his perfect, perfect plan for your life. I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of good and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Now, in relation to what that verse is saying, that was talking about the expected end of of, uh, Judah's captivity in Babylon. Okay, that's what that was specifically speaking of, that expected end. But the very fact of the matter is, That we, according to Galatians chapter 3, we have the spiritual promises given to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all of Israel. Those spiritual promises are ours. Israel was given the land. That's theirs. We, as believers, have been grafted into those promises. Galatians 3 lays all that out for us. Okay, And because of that, when we look at Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. He's not only saying that to Judah, he is saying that to all of mankind who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and are born of God. God has thoughts toward you. How about that? The God of all creation, the God who inhabits the highest of the high, and as he is there in the lofty places of heaven, he humbles himself, the Bible says, to consider things in heaven, And on earth. Realize it's even a humbling thing for God. He has to humble himself to even consider the things that go on in heaven, let alone the things that go on in earth. And then imagine this God has thoughts that he thinks towards you, toward you, not just about you, toward you. Thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end. Glory to God for that. What a, what a, Oh, why should I be discouraged? Why should the shadows come? I'm not, I'm not going to grate your ears any more of that. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. What a blessing to know that. What a holy thing. Ah, but that's stumbling. Okay, we looked at that in 2 Peter 1.10. Uh, let's go ahead over to Romans chapter 14 now. Again, keep your place here in 1 John. We're going to flip back to Romans. Romans is right after Acts. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 and 2 Corinthians. Romans chapter 14, uh, and we're going to begin at verse 7. We've got to take a little divergence in here and look at something that that the Lord showed me this week, and it's it's really great. Uh, Was it this morning or yesterday morning we found that? 
I think it was even yesterday morning, but we'll, we'll look at it when we get there. Verse 7, Romans chapter 14. And again, this is in relation to uh, there is none occasion of stumbling in him. Okay, uh, Romans 14, verse 7. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. And this brings great comfort in troubling times. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we're the Lord's. Do you have that confidence? Can you have that confidence in God? You can. The Bible says that you can right here. You can have the same confidence that what you have, that God has given you, doesn't matter if you live or die, whatever goes on in your life, you are the Lord's, and that is a peace that passeth all understanding. What a glory that is. I think of a, a, a missionary that, that we know, and uh, he's to a, a country where it's, there, there's a lot of heavy persecution going on. Okay? And his children asked him, he's on deputation, his children asked him, uh, they said, Papa, what, what happens when we go over there? Are we going to be safe? And he basically told his children, and brother, they're about the same age as your children, okay? Uh, He told his children, when we get there, we will be in the center of God's will, and that's the safest place you can ever be. And that's confidence in his God. So it doesn't matter what goes on in this country. It doesn't matter what goes on in this government. God reigns supreme. He sees it all. He sets up kings. He takes kings down. Sometimes he sets wicked rulers over a people to bring judgment. And we truly have turned our back on God. Why should God bless us here in America? He shouldn't. There's no reason whatsoever. The reason he hasn't completely wiped us out is the same reason he did wipe out Sodom and Gomorrah. It was for a lack of ten righteous men. And the only reason he has not wiped us out like Sodom and Gomorrah, because we are right there. We are coming to the point where sodomy is going to be mandated. It was in Sodom and Gomorrah. Bring out those men unto us that we may know them. They were commanded to do that. It's coming. If it happened before, it'll happen again. And this is the track it's heading in. I don't say that to scare us. I just say this to, so our minds can be clear when it happens. Okay? I do pray that I'm wrong. I would love it if, you know, by the end of my life, none of this happens. Great. Wonderful. But it's coming. Okay? But it, 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 America is right there with Sodom and Gomorrah. And the only reason God hasn't brought down fire and brimstone on us and just completely wiped us out and destroyed us. I think we see pockets of judgment here and there. Okay, I just can't help and think about all the fires and everything that are going out in California and all the flooding and the earthquakes. I mean, God uses those things. The flooding of New Orleans. What a wretched place. What a wicked place. God brought Katrina in. These are just things that we have to take in in light of the word of God. What has God done in the past? God in his holiness, would he do this today? Yeah, absolutely he would. But it was for a lack of 10 righteous men. And I believe there are 10 righteous men, at least, in this nation right now. And because of that, God has not brought that judgment. Besides all of that, we see there in 2 Peter that God knows how to uh, uh, preserve the just and to reserve the unjust to the day of judgment to be punished. Okay? So he knows how to sift all of that out. He's God. He can do what he wants, but he will constrain himself by what he's put in his word. He won't do anything outside of this book. That's right. So, okay. Um, that was, I was nowhere at all planning on talking about that, so hopefully somebody in here needed that tonight. Uh, praise the Lord. All right, verse 9. For to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be the Lord both of the dead and the living. Now, what's interesting about that is because we know that he died and we know that he rose. But there's three things that it says happened. He revived. To revive means to live again. Okay, so how, what do we do with this? Well, we just happen to know some things out of Zechariah chapter three, where Jesus Christ goes and is standing before God after his soul has been made an offering for sin in hell. And he's brought up out of that pit and he's placed in a large place there in Abraham's bosom. And he empties that Abraham's bosom out paradise and he brings it with him. 
and he leads captivity captive. And he goes and he stands before God, clothed in our filthy garments. Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. Zechariah chapter 3, you read through this. He's standing, Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the angel of the Lord says, take his filthy garments from him. Give him a change of raiment. I believe the narration of the Holy Ghost says, uh, and I said, put a fair mitre upon his head. And so they put that fair mitre on his head, what the high priest would wear. And they did all this, consecrated him. All right, and so there's that, that time where he goes and he's there and then he comes back. He then is raised from the dead. He revives, shows himself unto Mary, says, don't touch me. I have not yet ascended unto my father. And then from that point, he goes up and sprinkles his own blood behind the veil, in the flesh, bodily resurrected from the grave, making atonement full for our sins, entering once behind the veil, having obtained eternal redemption for us. And so this here, I believe, is pointing to that very fact that he died and then he rose and went up and stood before God came back, soul and spirit, back to that body. That body was resurrected because of the spirit of life that was in Christ Jesus. When he gave up that spirit, it was given to the hands of the Father. His spirit is then given back to the body of Jesus Christ, which revives him, brings him back to life. And so we see these, these three things you know, laid out. Those are our visitors and, and those who are, aren't familiar here. Uh, we've gone into great depth of, of looking in these things that we've seen lately. Um, But if you go into Zechariah chapter 3, and in relation to Zechariah 3 and Zechariah chapter 6, we see a mention of the branch being uh, referred to to this Joshua the high priest. And the branch in the Old Testament is referring to Jesus Christ, that righteous branch, okay, that'll come out of the the root of Jesse, all right? And and so then you go back into Zechariah chapter 3, and you see that it's Joshua the high priest, he says, is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Okay, that brand plucked from the fire is that, that thing that is rescued up out of that fire. It's a coal, a live coal. And then you also get there in Isaiah chapter 6, and we saw this the other day. Good night, that was beautiful. Isaiah chapter 6, and, and where Isaiah says, I, I, uh, I'm undone from a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. And the angel goes, and he takes a live coal from off of the altar and touches Isaiah's lips with it. And he says, thy iniquity is purged, and thy sin is forgiven. He is that live coal. Jesus Christ is that live coal. He is that brand plucked from the fire. And again, we find another way where we can find Jesus in the volume of the book. Because he said, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. In the volume of the book, it is written of me. And he's in the entire thing. If you know how to see him, if you know where to find him, what to look for. Um, and it's a beautiful thing when he, when he reveals himself. So that was the extra that I wanted to show you out of verse 9. But in relation to this none occasion of stumbling, we'll keep reading. For to this end, both Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be the Lord both of the dead and the living. Which is interesting because Jesus uh, really stumped the, the Sadducees. Um, you know, let's turn there. Mark, Mark chapter 12. This would be, uh, it'd be much easier for us to just read it than for me to try to muddle through an explanation of it. Mark chapter 12 and verses 26 and 27. The Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection, and they think that they have Jesus stumped with this question that I'm sure has, has stumped the Pharisees time and time again about, you know, these, these brothers all have this wife because, you know, according to Jewish law, the, if a brother died without having children, the wife was to go to the next one and the next one and the next one, and so he'd raise up seed to that, to that, that line. And so, you know, all the brothers had this wife, and then they die. They say, in the resurrection, whose wife is she? And he says this, um, verse 24, Do you not therefore err because you don't know the Scriptures, neither the power of God? For when they shall rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. And as touching the dead that they rise, have you not read in the book of Moses how in the bush God spake unto him, saying, I am, present tense, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Ye therefore do greatly err. Okay, and because of this, all right, this was Jesus Christ, I believe, speaking to the eternal word, speaking to Moses from the bush. I am the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. And he says, 
God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And so there has to be a resurrection. But then we see this. Jesus Christ, in Romans 14, for to this end Christ both died and rose and revived that he might be Lord, both of the dead and the living. As Lord, he can judge. As the Lord of all, he can judge. And so, because he died, because he rose, and because he revived, he is going to be Lord and judge of both the dead and the living. Now, who are the dead? Well, those are those ones that are in hell and that will be cast one day into the lake of fire. Because death and hell will be emptied out. And everyone whose name is not written in the book of life, they will stand before God. They give an account for the things done in their flesh. And he'll tell them, depart from me, I never knew you. You cursed into, into everlasting fire. And that he'll cast them into the lake of fire at that white throne judgment. And so he is able to be judge. He is able to be Lord, a commander, the leader, absolute Lord over both the dead and the living. Because he died, rose, and revived. Okay? The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, is, according to the scriptures, right here it is, the gospel. Verse 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? To set it not means to put them in a place where they're, they're just nothing to you. Okay? Uh, for we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Okay? So not only will the dead, but the dead in Christ also. Those in hell... And believers will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We will give an account for the things done in our body, whether they be good or whether they be bad. And Paul tells us we will suffer loss. There is going to be loss. It's much more than just this idea of a Bema seat, of, of just going and receiving your crown so that you can cast, cast them at Jesus' feet, and it's just going to be a great and wonderful time. No. You're going to stand before God. You're going to have to give an account for everything that he tried to get you to repent of in your life, that he showed you under the preaching of the word of God, the things that he stirred up, the things that he made manifest in you, those, those continual back, uh, uh, turning back, those, those continual sins that you refuse to let go of, your pride, your anger, your jealousy. Not, jealousy is not necessarily a bad thing. Your envy. We'll use the biblical word. Your envy. Okay? God's name is jealous. Okay, so if God's name is jealous, jealousy can't be bad then. All right, so envy is, when we talk about jealousy in a bad light, we're actually speaking of the word envy. Okay. But at, the, at that moment, we will give an account for our life. We will have a judgment seat of our own. And he'll tell you, you heard this preaching and this preaching and this preaching about being a sluggard, but yet you would not get out of bed. That's going to be part of my judgment. Yes. He remembers. He remembers. Yeah. And he'll, right. And that's, and that's why we live in the fear of the Lord. Okay. Understanding that fact. Um, A.W. Tozer, very well-known author, great man of God. He was a preacher for the Christian Missionary Alliance Church back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. He warned about what a lot of churches today are dealing with way back then. Okay? He warned about the apathy, warned about the, the carnality, the slipping. Okay? And, and we have our fair share of that here too. All right? So I'm not just pointing out. Um, but he warned about that type of thing. When he got to the end of his life, he was a very good friend with Leonard Ravenhill. Anybody ever heard of Leonard Ravenhill? I've quoted him a number of times. Um, don't agree with everything the man said, but he was a great man of God, and I've, I've benefited from his preaching. Um, but he told him, they were great friends, and he said, Len, come on in, you know, kick your shoes off and let's talk a little bit. And the one time he says, you know, I've been giving a great deal of thought toward the judgment seat. And thinking about the judgment seat, he says, I just can't get away from it. He says, I'm not so afraid of the things that I've done because I know that's in Christ and, and all of that is paid for. But it's the things I've left undone 
that terrify me. Leonard Ravenhill himself, there, were, there was quite a bit of an age gap. Um, I believe Tozer died in the 50s. Um, Leonard Ravenhill died in the early 90s. When Ravenhill got to the end of his life, he was working on writing a book about the judgment seat of Christ. He never finished it. I believe his son has finished it. But he, he became fixated on that thing. Another uh, great man of God, a great, uh, he was a Presbyterian preacher, uh, led a great revival in the Isle of Lewis in Scotland. His name is Duncan Campbell. He himself, when he got to the twilight years of his life, became fixated on the judgment seat of Christ and said almost the exact same thing. I believe even Charles Spurgeon, later on in years, got to that point. And so this is something that is very heavy on the mind of somebody who's about to have it. Oh, but we in our youth. Don't we just ignore the judgment? Oh, that's years away. I don't got to worry about it. No, now is the time you stand in fear of God. So that when you get into those gray years, which I'm well on my way already, you don't have to stand in, in fear. And I'm not picking on you at all because I say the same exact thing. I'm in trouble. I'm in great trouble. Yep. And so living in light of that, living in light of the judgment seat, um, I think it was Raven Hill that preached one time against living for the ashtray. Living, the things, living for the things that are just going to get burned up. All that, that wood, hay, and stubble. All right? The things that you've done, the, the traditions that you held so dear that had no grounding in the word of God, so much so that you preached them as doctrine, but they were just tradition. All right? One of those great traditions that we as Baptists like to hold to is a tie behind the pulpit. Okay? I wear a tie behind the pulpit. I do. I think it's a fine tradition. It does not hinder me whatsoever. It did in a clavic, so I didn't wear one. Okay? Uh, but as you see, I don't have it on, and I don't even have my shirt tucked in. Don't tell the other independent Baptists out there, please. Okay? All I'm trying to say, it's not what you wear. All right? So far too often, what we wear has turned into tradition. And then we try to preach it as though it's doctrine. Listen, as long as you have your skivvies on, we'll make it work. Okay? You come. I want you covered. Maybe we'll find a choir robe stuffed in some corner someplace. We don't even have any choir robes. I don't know. We'll find something to help you cover up. I'd rather have you here hearing the preaching of the word of God than have you stay home because you're not think you're dressed right. All right? And that's a tradition that some hold so tightly. And I'm afraid, I'm afraid that it's one that is going to be burnt up at the judgment seat. Okay? I'm, I'm all for bringing our best before God. I'm a, I'm absolutely. Can I clarify that, that the judgment seat, the judgment seat for the Christian is after salvation. The judgment seat for the Christian is when you stand before God. When you're dead. After you are dead. Yes. Oh, you're speaking of the things done. Right. Okay. So, what she, she, what, yeah, I understand where you're going with this now. Okay. Yes. Um, judgment seat for the Christian. The things done in your flesh prior to Christ are paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. It's more than under the blood. It's completely washed away. Okay. Uh, the, the bulls and goats and heifers and the calves and all of that, that covered sin. So those sins were under the blood at that point. But the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Okay? Even so much so that in 1 John chapter 3, no. Yeah. Hold on. I got I to gotta look. It's right here. Yeah, 3, 9. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. So that person in you that Christ creates, when you are born of God, he literally makes a new creature in you in his own image, on the inward parts. That one is who God sees. That one is who has the mind of Christ. That one is who cannot commit sin. But yet we still have our carnal mind. 
We still have our flesh. And carnality is just being driven by what we want, what we need. Hunger is a carnal need. Thirst is a carnal need. Lust is a carnal need. Okay? This is, that's a carnal mind. It's driven by those things. It's not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be. It's enmity with God. Okay? But all those things before Christ are gone. And now that you are in Christ, what we allow in our flesh, we are going to suffer loss for. And we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and we will give an account for the things done in our flesh. Um, okay, Romans. Boy, Romans just, we end up preaching when we get to Romans. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I believe the Lord was in it. All right. We were in Romans 14, uh, verse 10. Uh, for we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather that no man put a stumbling block, and here it is, or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. All right, there's that occasion of stumbling, as we saw in, in verse 10 in 1 John. Uh, that occasion to, of stumbling, that is that thing that we set before our brother that would make him fall. That thing that I can do that you cannot, or that thing that you can do in the liberty and grace of God, but I cannot. It would cause me to stumble and fall. Okay? Um, there are certain things that I believe the Word of God is very clear on as far as ab abstaining from all appearance of evil and, and all of this, but there are some things that you just, you can apply some biblical principles to it, but you've got to rely on the liberty that you have in Christ to guide you in that thing. Okay? But use not your liberty for a cloak of covetousness okay? or lasciviousness. So, uh, just to fulfill your flesh. All right. Um, and lastly, uh, we're almost done here. Galatians chapter 5. If you want to turn there, Galatians chapter 5. Right after 2 Corinthians, you find Galatians. Chapter 5 uh, and verse 13. It goes right along with what we've been talking about. Uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. All right? Don't you hear the same wording in 1 John? It's exactly saying the same thing. Uh, verse 14. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. Okay? This is talking about this brotherly love. And we're all guilty of it in here. Every single one of us. We bite and devour one another. We talk about people. We say things with a snarky attitude that we ought not to say. You know, just because something's true doesn't mean that it has to be said. All right? You know, you think of, uh, what was that, that uh, acronym? Um, think. Oh, yeah. Uh, when, when you're about to say something, stop and think. Is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? Is it kind? If it doesn't meet all five of those things, just don't say it. Even if you think it really should be said, just don't say it. Oh, but that tongue, that tongue gets away from us, doesn't it? What's that? I'm going to quote a verse, and then I'm going to have you say that again, because I might forget it. Our tongue gets away from us, but out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh, and the tongue is set on fire of hell. The tongue is set on fire of hell. Just think what damage you can do with your tongue. That's why you see so much preaching about it out of the word of God. We don't bite and devour one another. We love one another. If you don't have love for your brethren, you're abiding in darkness even until now. And you need Jesus Christ. That's what it says. That's what the word of God says. As hard as that is to accept, as hard as that is to, to receive, uh, that's what it says. 
He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. You're not going to cause your brother to stumble. You're not going to do something that will make your brother stumble and fall. You know, that's the farthest thing from your mind. Well, we got through our two verses tonight. Seems to be that's what we've been about doing is two verses each week. Um, I'm okay with it. You know, I have no time frame on this thing. You know, we'll, we'll finish it when we get done. But uh, we're done for tonight, though. Um, let's see. Corbin, would you want to pray for us tonight? Thank you. Amen.